Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I think, I think this presentation has a nice kind of natural progression from the previous two. One, because uh, James provided this quite uh, kind of macro perspective of what's going on across the region and, and these macro trends. And Luke's kind of then focused it on six countries. And then I'm going to delve even deeper into one country, specifically in Nigeria, which I think is a nice follow through given Luke's shown that's, that's shown the fastest exit from agriculture. Um, and then secondly, this progression from you know, talking about agriculture and the role of youth there to thinking more broadly about the role of youth and the broader food system. Um, so this work is something I usually don't do. It's basically providing some early descriptive um, analysis of a survey that we've just recently completed in Nigeria, not specifically focused on the youth. Um, it was focused more generally on the informal food sector. But uh, as we looked more into the data, we did see some interesting youth patterns that, that I'll talk to you about in just a minute. I just first want to take a step back um, and contextualize why looking specifically at urban informal food trade. Um, so first, why looking at informal trade overall? Um, and I think this is when we hear a lot about structural change in Africa and particularly work of Danny Roderick and Maggie McMillan recently, um, there's this talk about you know, most, most, much of the structural change has been out of agriculture into this kind of low productivity informal economy. Um, and so this is a bit, a bit of a concern that though we have some structural change, it's not necessarily in high productivity jobs, it's in the informal sector. Um, and why are we looking at the urban area? Well, youth are seen to be, because of life cycle effects that, um, that Luke was talking about, um, they're seen to be disproportionately more likely to migrate to urban areas looking for new opportunities. Um, and finding them predominantly in the informal economy, we know the most recent ILO reports tells us within urban Africa, um, the, uh, within the non-ag non sector, the informal economy is the predominant source of employment. And food is the major share of employment within informal uh, trade. Um, it's one of the largest segments of the informal economy. So I think we have... Um, you know, a good justification for looking at, well, what are kind of the livelihoods of uh, those working in this sector um, and, and finding out if it is disproportionately a sector in which the youth are concentrated in. I also just want to justify a little bit why are we looking at Nigeria? Um, well, I think James started out with this graphic, you know, showing this, this large population growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Nigeria is undoubtedly playing a huge role in some of that population growth, given its size. Um, we know for policymakers in Nigeria that urban youth un- and underemployment is a huge issue, um, particularly this rhetoric of, around underemployed young men. Um, you know, being mobilized for Boko Haram in the Northeast and also in the Southeast into the Niger Delta gangs. Um, so it's certainly an important policy issue in Nigeria. Of those in the informal sector, uh, the labor force survey for Nigeria shows that about 41% are in uh, retail trade. And then uh, this kind of informal food sector um, is really the source of food security for about two thirds of the population. So despite a lot of the excitement about supermarkets um, that we saw about 15 years ago, about the growth of supermarkets in Africa, we're still seeing quite a large share, about two thirds of the population in Nigeria, but we're seeing about equivalent rates throughout Africa still sourcing from informal sectors. And so when I'm talking about the informal food sector, I'm talking about street hawkers, I'm talking about those in, in informal markets, um, often trading with relatively poor drainage, relatively poor sanitation facilities, and so you also have huge food safety concerns as well. In Nigeria, you see that, and actually this is, is quite true across the region, but um, in Nigeria, because it's a federal system, you see a lot of variation um, within states in terms of their policies towards informal vending. Most have quite harsh policies towards vending. Um, it's seen as being, you know, it's often deemed illegal to be trading on the streets. Um, you have a lot of low-level extortion and bribes from police officers of, of traders trying to make a living. Um, in Niger State, uh, there's been repeated demolitions of market stalls that are seen to be unfit or on land that was demarcated for other property development. But you do have a little bit of variation. Um, so in Cross River State, they recently implemented this uh, hawker's rights bill, giving greater protection to those who are trading on the street. So in terms of methodology, 
Um, my colleagues and I at IFPRI, we surveyed 1,100 traders in two of Nigeria's secondary cities, Mina, um, which is in Niger State and in kind of the northwest, um, and Calabar, which is in the southeast and Cross River State. And we wanted to really focus on these two cities because a lot of the work on Nigeria is primarily focused on Lagos. Um, there's hardly much work um, outside of Abuja um, on secondary cities. So of course in Nigeria, you know, a secondary city is, is, is huge comparatively. I mean, we're talking about 350,000 or 400,000 people, which is quite large comparatively. Um, but when you're comparing to a Lagos of 10 million people, it, it's definitely seen, these are definitely seen as secondary cities. And we chose these two cities in particular because of so much variation between them. Um, when we talk about kind of African youth, we, we have these broad generalizations. And I think, and then Luke's starting to show some of the variation across country. Now we're just trying to even see subnationally what type of variation we have amongst the youth. Um, and so, I mean, two key issues here is that we have strong variation in terms of kind of sociocultural background. Mina is a heavily Muslim city and Calabar is a heavily Christian city. Um, these are also two very different political strongholds. They, in terms of votes, uh, Mina is very supportive of the ruling party and uh, Calabar is very supportive of the, the PDP. That may have some implications for um, policies and, and trust in government. And then the regulatory setting is quite different. As I just mentioned, in Cross River State, where Calabar is, they had this hawker's bill that was recently implemented. Um, but in, in Niger State, they're kind of known for um, large-scale demolitions of stalls. What we did is we tried to stratify um, between those who are located in established markets and those who are just trading on pavements and streets. And we did that because those who are usually on the pavements and streets typically um, are not, uh, don't have enough money to kind of pay the kind of uh, local government taxes that they need to be in the markets. They often can't afford a stall um, in the formal markets. And therefore, they're typically, based on kind of our theoretical understanding, typically more exposed to harassment by the government. So we wanted to stratify by that characteristic to see if we actually get that variation um, in our sample. We focused on traders in three uh, types of food groups. We have those focused on fresh food, so you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, those focused on prepared food, so these are kind of you know, street food, snacks. Um, and then we have packaged foods. These are more kind of manufactured, often imported uh, food goods that they're selling. Um, and again, this was to see if there's some type of variation, particularly if there's some type of um, variation in terms of harassment or socioeconomic status in terms of what people are selling. Okay, so we're asking just four questions, pretty simple questions from the data. Again, it's just some broad descriptive work um, to, to kind of motivate some further analysis. So the first is just looking from a demographic perspective. Um, are traders disproportionately young? Um, and when I look at the youth in Africa, I typically like to break it up into two age categories. One is 18 to 24. 24 is the cutoff that the UN uses for the youth. Um, they use 15 to 24, but for ethical reasons, we're only allowed to survey from 18 to 24. And then the African Union uses 34 years old um, as the cutoff for youth. So I often like to see if there's any, any variation that's 18 to 34 is a huge age group, so I like to kind of um, see if there's any variation between those. And when we're looking at traders in particular, we do see um, that when we're talking about youth being in this informal food trade sector, um, we're not really talking about the youngest here, our 18 to 24-year-olds, but it does tend to be about a third of our traders in both cities are in this, this 25 to 34 group, so this kind of older um, of the youth group. I think what's really important um, is the gender dimension here. Um, when we talk about youth, there does seem to be this implicit um, emphasis on men, male youth, and I think that's because of policy concerns about what it means to have underemployed or unemployed um, male youth. Um, but you know, the food sector in general in Africa um, tends to be uh, the livelihood predominantly of women, um, and we find this in our uh, in Calabar, in our sample in Calabar, about 70% of our young traders in our 18 to 34 year old group um, are disproportionately women. Um, but we find only 23% in MENA. And so we think that there's something, uh, particularly with the religious dimension, that's motivating that. Uh, also, in terms of migration, when we look at other types of demographics and we think about this issue, are people moving to the city, are young people moving to the city, 
Um, and again, we find this really interesting differentiation at the subnational level. Approximately half of our youth group, um, youth traders in, in Calabar, are migrants. Um, most are coming from a neighboring state. Um, and we have less than a quarter of the youth are actually migrants in MENA. Our second question is trading, is it seen as a stepping stone or is it the status quo? Um, and I think in, in some of the literature and some of our, our colleagues at IFPRI, you know, talk about people moving out of agriculture into kind of the informal trade sector as kind of a stepping stone moving along this process of structural transformation. Um, I think one of our most interesting results is in, in both, um, both cities that we looked at, um, approximately 80% of our youth group had at least one parent who was also a trader. So this is more of a family tradition rather than kind of seen as, okay, my parents did agriculture, I'm moving into trade. Um, there's, there's definitely a, a continuity in terms um, of this career choice. Following up on Luke's point about education, um, we're seeing the same the same dynamic uh, in our sample, where we have rel relatively well-educated traders um, compared to their older counterparts. So we have a much higher share in this um, secondary completed, this, this dark orange component. And you see our older group, it's, it's a bit smaller, gets larger as you go down uh, the age group here. Um, and also larger with some having some secondary education as well. Um, and this is consistent with, with what we found um, in some other countries as well, because of basically kind of free primary education, now free secondary education in some of these countries, um, you are seeing an, an increase in people accessing school. Of course, the quality is questionable, as Luke mentioned. Um, again, another interesting subnational dynamic is those who are seeing this as, you know, this is going to be their job versus they're just looking, f they're temporarily in this. Uh, position looking for another job. Um, again, we see a big difference between Calabar, we have our youth, particularly our youngest cohort, um, saying that you know, they're looking for another job. They don't see this as really their, um, their main occupation. I'm going to just move quickly through the last two slides here. The third question, are they disproportionately vulnerable? Um, and when we're talking about vulnerability, um, one thing we're thinking about is uh, are they working more disproportionately as street hawkers or on outside on the pavements and the streets versus being able to come into an actual established market? Um, again, we have these different, different uh, subnational dimensions here. So if you're in MENA, which is kind of highlighted in yellow here, um, you really don't really see the youth being disproportionately on the streets. Um, you only have about 26.9% and 26.5% of our two age cohort, youth age cohorts being on the street. Um, by contrast, in Calabo, for example, you have 59% of our, our youngest cohort um, being trading on the streets rather in an established market. In both cities, the youth really cannot afford their own market stall compared to older cohorts. And most of them are actually just able to rent a stall. They can actually afford to own a stall. Um, no real significant difference in terms of the number of customers they have or the amount of turnover, um, the amount of sales that they have per day. And interestingly, compared to the, what I said earlier about the policy environment, actually our youth in Calabar um, are actually experiencing higher levels of government harassment. So this is despite the fact that this hawker's bill was instituted there. And what many of them told us was, well, now we were allowed to trade, but we're facing a lot more kind of low level um, extortion by, um, by police officers. So we're not being forced off the street, but we're being asked to pay bribes. And then finally, um, uh, the last question, are young traders disproportionately mobilized? In the book um, James and I edited five years ago, which I think kind of motivated the, the panel a little bit, I looked about youth political participation and are the youth disproportionately engaged in protest? Um, and we did find some, some evidence for that. Um, and we are actually finding a little bit of that as well in the survey. We're seeing that um, uh, youth in MENA, uh, they're significantly more likely to be participating in rallies political rallies, demonstrations, and protests than their older counterparts. So um, a big difference across cohorts there. Same level of participation in Calabar, but no difference across age groups. And overall, kind of affirming what we find in the broader literature about the informal economy, um, that there's very low levels of associational engagement, very few are any, in any type of informal sector organization. So just to conclude quickly, 
Um, you know, going back to James's original questions, um, I guess I can address the first question. It's really, I think, a lot from looking at the informal traders. We do see some interesting, um, you know, youth versus older cohort patterns. But in general, I think what we're beginning to see from this survey is that employment in Nigeria seems to be more of a, a structural issue rather than a, a youth challenge in particular. Um, and a lot of these traders are actually fa following in a family tradition rather than you know, progressing from the farm to trade. Um, we're fine. We found the exact same thing in Ghana where we did the uh, exact same survey. And I think the overall big takeaway message is that our discussion about policy responses um, just needs to be so much more nuanced than I think we've seen and heard thus far in a lot of the broader policy discourse, not just across different youth groups, but obviously even subnationally as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.